Live from Singapore, this is Insight with me, Haslinda Amin, where we dive deeper into the stories that matter with crucial context and sharp analysis. We head live to Tokyo, where investors are grappling with the LDP Alliance's election setback. This is the first time the ruling coalition has failed to win a majority since 2009. Oil slums as Israel limits its attacks on Iran to only military targets, avoiding crude, nuclear and civilian facilities. Tehran also downplays the impact of the attack. For more on these stories, we're joined by a great lineup of guests. Former NATO Supreme Allied Commander General Wesley Clark joins us in just a few minutes. Carol Nadley, CEO and founder of Crystal Energy, will be on later on to discuss oil markets and Tying all of these to the broader investment outlook will be Javelin Wealth Management's Polka Mishra. Some surprising swings in Japanese markets today as the ruling LDP coalition failed to win a majority in the election over the weekend, while the yen is slumping on concerns about the latest political instability. The Nikkei jumped in the morning session. Futures now also pointing to a higher open. Take a look at the yen, 153.61. Well, for more, let's bring in the Asia trade co anchor Sherry on in Tokyo. Sherry, that snap election seemed like a good idea, but now, Ishiba facing political uncertainty. What are we looking for next? It's really unclear right now if Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba will be able to cling on to his job. You said it, he made a gamble, and it didn't really play out very well with his Liberal Democratic Party and ruling partner Komeito falling short of that magic number of 233 seats that they needed in the parliamentary vote for him to stay on as Premier. So Ishiba has said that he was willing to cooperate with other parties if their policies align. We'll be hearing from him in about two hours' time where he'll have a press conference and we'll have a clearer idea of what his government could end up looking like or even if he resigns. Prime Minister uh, Ishiba has uh, taken that post on his fifth attempt. This is a longtime politician. He's served in several roles in government here in Japan, including as defense minister. So a lot of people thinking that if anybody can pull off this negotiation with other parties, it could be him. But we are seeing what's clear here in Japan, the strong public resentment when it comes to that political funding scandal that we've seen here with the Liberal Democratic Party. With revelations last year, the party members were enriching themselves themselves with funds from supporters. So what happens in the long term with this administration is a key question. Well, we know that coalition talks may take weeks. That means uncertainty. What's the implications for the economy, for the markets? It was really interesting to see today that we saw Japanese stocks reversing earlier losses at the open just to gain ground. But the Japanese yen continues to weaken. We're talking about lows that we haven't seen in months. And this all coming at a time when there's really a lot of political uncertainty about what happens to Japan's government in the future, right? What that means for policy implications for the Bank of Japan will be interesting because when we saw the BOJ hiking rates back in July, a lot of observers were thinking that was because of the weakness of the Japanese yen, which was close to that 162 level per dollar. We're seeing the Japanese yen this year become the worst G10 performer. So whether or not this will actually pressure the BOJ to tighten more and, and fasten the pace of those rate hikes will be the key question. And long term, what this means, if Prime Minister Ishiba were to go, could we see the resurgence of other politicians such as nationalist uh, Sanae Takaichi, for example? She was a key contender in the LDP presidential elections. We know that she stands against the BOJ when it comes to hiking rates. That will be a key issue right now. We're seeing stocks gaining ground because, of course, with a weaker yen, we usually see shares supported. But we also heard from Nico Asset Management this morning talking about the fundamentals of uh, Japanese stock markets, including favorable earnings, increased payouts, and conservative valuations that has still make Japan an attractive investment destination.
That's right. And for now, Sherry, the question is when we might see intervention for the yen. Our co-anchor, Sherry Yan, in Tokyo, thank you so much for your insights. Well, our next guest cites Japan as one of our top conviction calls, but believes it will be challenged given the election results. Let's bring in Polka Mishra, our partner at Javelin Wealth Management. Polka, good to have you with us. The yen front and center, we're seeing it at 153 and change. We're just wondering when that intervention might come. The thing is, you know, the situation couldn't be worse. I mean, it was under pressure already from the rising yields in the U.S. Yes, so uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, yes, we do have the holding. Fundamentals are strong. It's quite disappointing that such a political upheaval has to happen now when Japan was just turning around. Uh, intervention for a yen would probably come closer to a 160. It can drop to a 160 again. Uh, how strong that intervention will be and what Governor Oeda will be able to do when all these decisions are being made remains to be seen. Structural story is strong. Um, it remains to be seen what the narrative comes out. If we see a resignation from the Prime Minister, then it becomes a lot more uncertain. We'll see a weakness much faster. Otherwise, Mark is going to wait and watch to see what sort of coalition we get in place. There is trepidation investors on edge because this could stretch for several weeks until that coalition is resolved. I'm just wondering when might we see that 160 level or 155 is the level, the next level we're looking at. 155 could be very soon. We're close to 153 already. Yeah, within, within the week and uh, in a couple of weeks time, the 160 is very much possible, I think. Uh, whether we get any narrative in terms of coalition and support for fiscal policies, I doubt that is going to happen during this period. Given those assumptions, how best to play the yen? Where are the opportunities? So we remained hedged in our position in Japan, and fortunately so. Uh, we saw the equity sell-off anyway last, uh, last week, so the markets were kind of prepared for this. Uh, and that's why probably the markets not reacted as strongly. Yes, uh, the yen weakening is there would just suggest that keep the hedges on. It's, it's, not, it's too volatile a market to take a one-sided bet. It could go either ways. So long story, Japan is still a conviction story. The fundamentals are strong. Corporates are generating those returns after the reforms. Inflation is sticking up, which of course has a role to play in the election, but on the whole, as a macroeconomic picture, still remains a pretty strong, strong story. Of course, the weekend also benefits uh, exporters, which is a yes. great deal because they're helping to uh, keep uh, the Nikkei 225 and, well supported. And tourism as well. So there are sectors that benefit, but it's going to be very short term. We will see intervention at that 160 level. So yes, if you're a short term trader, yes, there are opportunities out there to rotate out of certain tech sectors. But in in the long run, the way we focus on the market, we still stick to the fundamental story. We we'll stick to a bit more domestically oriented uh, sectors as opposed to those that have uh, an international component, uh, more of a yen component attached to them. Polka, hang tight. Polka Mishra, Javelin Wealth Management is sticking around. Well, up next, we'll get insights on tensions in the Middle East from retired U.S. General Wesley Clark. We'll discuss prospects for a regional deal after Israel's restrained attack on Iran over the weekend. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Israelis actually went after the production process and apparently uh, destroyed at least 20 what they call planetary mixers, which are critically important for actually producing the solid fuel uh, without which ballistic missiles can't travel. So they've done tremendous da damage. If Iran wants to act against Israel, it is more limited because they know a further Israeli strike would almost certainly go to their uh, their oil and their petrochemical refineries and they do not have an air defense and cannot reconstitute one quickly enough to defend against that. 
Khan. Those were guests early on Bloomberg talking about what Israel achieved from Saturday's attack on Iranian military targets. Now, the strikes which avoided Iran's oil and nuclear installations seemed more restrained than many expected and could help boost diplomatic efforts for a regional ceasefire. Let's discuss this and more with former NATO Supreme Allied Commander Wesley Clark. He retired as a four-star general after 38 years in the United States military and is currently chairman and CEO of Wesley K. Clark and Associates. And still with us is Polka Mishra, partner at Javelin Wealth Management. Uh, general, let's start with you. It does seem like a calculated move, this targeted strike. The worst has been averted. Are we fair to assume, is it fair to assume that perhaps uh, a de-escalation would ensue from here? Well, I think it was a calculated strike. I think they did exactly what was necessary to prepare for a second phase attack, if that's if that if that's warranted. And that is, they opened the door. So they took out radars, they took out air defense that was significant, uh, and they left the Iranians much more vulnerable. They also, as Aaron David Miller said, uh, took out some of the mixing capacities for Iran to produce more ballistic missiles. But Iran supposedly has about 2,000 of these ballistic missiles. Maybe some of the underground storage sites were attacked and, and some of them were destroyed. So now it's Iran's move. Iran has said it will uh, retaliate. It said it to its own people. It said it softly. Uh, but if it does, uh, Israel will be ready to come down with a hammer. Uh, the thing is, both sides are not likely to want a wider regional war. Uh, can we see de-escalation efforts from here? Is that enough to assume that given what Israel did, that even if Iran were to retaliate, were to respond, it will be pretty minor? Well, both sides say they don't want a regional war. But the truth is, the clock's ticking on Iran's nuclear capacity. And really, since uh, the mid-aughts, the United States and Israel have worried about Iran developing a nuclear weapon. Um, President Obama put a lot of effort into negotiating a uh, extension of that time period by 10 years through the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action. President Trump and his administration got rid of that. Uh, Iran's probably within a week of having uh, enough fissile materials to assemble a nuclear a device, maybe not a weapon, but maybe a weapon. We don't know. Uh, but this would dramatically change the Middle East, and there's not a single one of our allies uh, in the region who say we'd be better off if Iran had a nuclear weapon. So that's what's behind this. So Iran is carefully gauging what it must do. It doesn't want to lose that nuclear capacity that it thinks Israel could attack. And some in Israel are saying, this is the moment. As soon as Iran crosses that line, we've got the full pretext we need. We took out Iraq's nuclear weapon facility. We took out Syria. It's time to go after Iran. So it's not clear exactly what's going to happen right now. Uh, General, people talk about the risk of unintended consequences now that we've seen both sides, Iran and Israel, uh, attacking directly each other. How are you assessing that risk? I think there would be a risk, uh, especially to um, states in the region, uh, to global uh, energy security. Certainly, Iran would probably uh, reach out to try to do something uh, to hinder oil exports and might also have the means with shorter range assets to attack, let's say, Saudi Arabia's uh, energy facilities. Uh, all that is a possibility. It's all the reason why the United States keeps saying we don't want to escalate. But there's an underlying dynamic here, and that dynamic is nothing in the region is going to be better if Iran gets a nuclear weapon and the same government stays in power. That government's committed to the destruction of Israel. And at one time or another, the Ayatollahs have said, oh, if we get a nuclear weapon, we'll use it. So, um, so everybody in Israel is on, they're, they're on tenterhooks. They know that this is a critical moment in the security of the state of Israel. And so it's a little bit unpredictable, despite um, what the unintended consequences might be on the global economy. And Polka, how are you reading the latest developments in the Middle East? I mean, how are you factoring geopolitics into the decisions you make in the markets? So um, as unfortunate as the situation is in the Middle East, Slinda, it's not had as much of an implication on our global market allocations. We've 
kept a hedge on oil as a Six Sigma event, but as the general was speaking right now, that at this point, the escalation hasn't gotten to the effect that it's impacting the oil prices. In fact, over the weekend, the oil prices fell. So the market's kind of been ignoring that potential risk that may come through from an escalation. The escalations have been very short-lived and then it retraces back. So we haven't seen that happening yet. And that's why the portfolio is positioned as such. Yes, you use gold as a hedge. Yes, you don't uh, expose yourself to those geographies. But that's been the extent of our portfolio allocation uh, based on uh, just keeping the war in place, mm. in mind. There's always that risk of an escalation. And that's one of the risks in the markets. Another risk general, of course, is the upcoming election. You have to wonder what a Trump or a Harris administration would mean in terms of how they view developments in the Middle East. Well, if I were the Iranians and I wanted to strike back, I'd do it before the election here in the United States when the Biden administration's still in charge. During that period after the election, no matter who's elected, uh, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. There's going to be less ability of the United States to grip the parties. And if Mr. Trump wins the election, he's already said that on some matters, he may say to Mr. Netanyahu, BB, do what you have to do. Um, on the other hand, Mr. Trump's been wary of starting wars. One of his principal campaign pledges is he won't get us into World War III. J.D. Vance has said the problem with these generals that are criticizing Trump is they want a war. So uh, the, the rhetoric here is a little confusing because uh, we know that uh, Mr. Trump has been a wholehearted supporter of Israel and uh, has been an enemy of Iran and that Iran has apparently tried to assassinate Mr. Trump. So, um, so there are a lot of uh, still potential uncertainties here, but I think if uh, Kamala Harris is, uh, is elected, I think you'll see um, more of the same policy of trying to manage the escalation and to forestall it. Uh, if Mr. Trump is elected, uh, it's a little bit un more uncertain. Uh, General, I wanted to ask you this. In case of a Harris presidency, uh, We've all talked a lot about what may happen in case Donald Trump comes in and what happens to the oil prices. But if it is a Harris presidency, then there's the escalation in the Middle East, or the situation in the Middle East, but her focus on clean tech. Uh, how do you think it's going to balance out in terms of energy prices for the longer run? I think um, if there is escalation uh, in the Middle East, it'll be short and sharp. Uh, I think Israel's had mm -hmm. plans to take this a step against the Iranian nuclear facilities for many years. They have over time developed the techniques and the equipment necessary to do this. Uh, and I think, as you said, the market tends to underprice risk. So I think there might be a sharp spike and then it'll be it'll be back down again. But in terms of the longer term, there, there's no immediate replacement for hydrocarbons. Uh, in the global economy. You just can't get enough renewables in fast enough with the existing technology. And uh, even with lithium and batteries and so forth, the renewables are, are still uh, not base load for electricity. You have heavy equipment, you have ships, you have other things that rely on hydrocarbon. Uh, yes, uh, small nuclear reactors look good, uh, but they're not out there yet. Uh, and they're several years away, and larger nuclear projects are 10 years away. So uh, in the near term, uh, it's going to be a reliance on hydrocarbons, on oil and gas. There are new discoveries uh, all the time, big discoveries uh, off the coast of Guyana that are being uh, developed, but, but also potential elsewhere. So I would say that uh, in general, there's going to be an effort to find new technologies in renewables, there will still be in market incentives for this under uh, uh, President Harris, uh, but uh, you're still going to need to frack. You're going to need to have hydrocarbons. You're gonna need, you need a strategic petroleum reserve, and it's going to be many, many years before you can move away from that. And Polka, to that point, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on clean energy. We've seen how hedge funds are now shorting uh, green energy. They're going long fossil fuels. What are your thoughts on that? It uh, really depends on what you think is going to happen in the elections. If it is a Harris presidency, definitely you will see a lot more investment in clean tech. You're going to see a lot more in renewables. Uh, if it is a Trump presidency, it's going to be more fossil fuels and oil. And that is more short to medium term. Long term uh, direction can be very different.
So for us, we are taking a more neutral view. But yes, if you think there's going to be a Harris presidency, that's the sector to invest in right now. And General, we've heard from uh, Vance that uh, when it comes to Trump, Trump will ensure that the U.S. remains in NATO. That's quite different from what we heard back in 2020 when he threatened that the U.S. Would, would quit NATO. Your thoughts on how reliable such messaging is right now? Well, I think the administration, uh, or I think the potential administration of Mr. Trump would see a reduced role of the United States in Europe, including uh, difficulties in leading NATO and maybe not even wanting to lead NATO. And certainly our NATO allies are very concerned about this. But in the election run up right now, I, I, I you know, there's so many things being said by Mr. Trump and, and, and Mr. Vance that uh, you don't know whether they're believable or not. Mr. Trump says he's the father of in vitro fertilization, but he just learned what it was from a senator. And uh, Mr. <laughs> Vance, uh, you know, says all kinds of things. Uh, at this point, they're, they're desperate to try to neutralize any attacks uh, on what their program might be, but they're not really saying what their program is. When it comes to the rest of Asia, uh, a Trump administration would have great implications for countries like China, for instance, those tariffs that he intends to impose on the country and uh, impose on uh, Chinese uh, imports. Uh, what would this mean for relations between the two and what would the ripple effects be? So I think uh, Mr. Trump is, um, is somewhat unpredictable. Uh, but insofar as he takes advice from uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and we don't know what has really been said in these uh, phone calls back and forth, but insofar as he does, we know that uh, Mr. Putin is not preaching world peace and harmony. From Russia's geostrategic perspective, it's in Russia's interest to see heightened tensions and even conflict between the United States and China. Why? Because it puts Russia in a stronger position. So uh, during his first administration, uh, Mr. Trump ratcheted up the pressure with China. Will he do it again? Uh, maybe, maybe not, because the two economies are so interconnected, and uh, depending on who he listens to at one particular time or another, he may decide enough's enough. He may balance off and push away a little bit from Vladimir Putin. It, it's, it's very uh, difficult to predict because Mr. Trump is impulsive. He, he, he takes advice from the last people he listens to, uh, and he surrounds himself with a panoply of advisors who advise different things at different times. So it's a little unpredictable, and this is one of the things right. that had our allies worried about around the world. You talked about how Trump is impulsive, unpredictable. Is he a national security risk for the U.S.? The people that have served with him say that he's a national security risk for the United States. And not only is he impulsive, but um, but he gives out information. He says things that uh, shouldn't be said. We don't know uh, what he did with the documents that he took from the White House. Uh, maybe they've disappeared. Maybe some didn't, were shared. Uh, we know that when he first was elected to office, he uh, called in the Russian ambassador and another uh, Russian diplomat and told him, hey, I'm in office. And uh, uh, and there's no telling what he said. H.R. McMaster said, who was the national security advisor at the time, said, well, I don't think he said anything that was classified, but other people thought that he indeed give, did give away secure information. I've talked to people who serve with him say, yes, they consider he's a national security risk. But, you know, if he has greater power and more experience, right. who knows what Mr. Trump's going to do? General, thank you so much for your time today. Wesley Clark, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, Paul Kamishra of Javelin Wealth Management, is sticking around. Let's take a look at how U.S. futures are looking at this point in time. Of course, it is a big week uh, for the U.S. with those 30% uh, of the S&P reporting earnings. S&P futures pointing to higher open up by half a percent. Up next, more analysis on the Middle East conflict and its impact on oil prices. The CEO of Crystal Energy will be joining us live from Abu Dhabi. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back. Here's a closer look at the market reaction to Israel's weekend strikes on Iran. Crude prices are tumbling after the attacks avoided the OPEC members' crude facilities. VIX futures and gold also lower as traders seem to be taking the latest escalation in stride. Let's bring in Carol Nachli, CEO and founder at Crystal Energy, to discuss more about the Middle East and oil. Paul Kamishra from Javelin Wealth Management is still with us. Carol, good to have you with us. I mean, we've seen oil uh, getting dumped down as much as 5%, uh, now lower by about 4 uh, How are you assessing, uh, I guess, the drop in risk? Good morning. I have to say that this did not come as a surprise, given the fact that the attacks of Israel on Iran did not, uh, were actually, there were lots of fears before the attack happened, right? And then when the attack happened, they did not, it did not affect, for example, uh, oil facilities or nuclear facilities or more important ener uh, energy infrastructure in Iran. And also Iran, there were reports from Iran that Iran is not going to retaliate and kind of downplayed the attacks in a sense that the fear that preceded the attacks has been, been deflated by the attacks themselves because they were not commensurate with those fears. Years, and that by itself translated into a reduction in the geopolitical risk premium that we saw being added to oil prices. What we are seeing today in oil prices, we're still seeing geopolitical risk premium, but not as elevated as before the attacks. And now mm. it's a question of time whether Iran is going to respond. But so far, they said they are not in a rush to respond to these weak attacks as they described them. So war premium dissipating, where do you see oil prices settling then? If the geopolitical risk does not increase again, and again I'm saying if because we are facing a very important period of uncertainty, primarily the results of the U.S. elections, which are going to happen very soon, and that by itself can change the direction of what's happening in the Middle East. But at the moment, if I take the geopolitical risk aside, I don't see the picture changing dramatically from before the conflict started in the Middle East because the market fundamentals were not pointing to towards very high prices. They were pointing to prices between the 70 and the 80 dollars range because you do have weaker economic growth, weaker demand growth, particularly from China, strong oil supply, particularly from outside OPEC. And even within OPEC Plus, we are seeing still overproduction from certain members such as Iraq. So on balance, if I look only at the market fundamentals, I don't see the picture changing dramatically between now and the end of the year. But again, geopolitics can change the equation drastically. Geopolitics can change pretty immediately, but so far, all prices have been pretty moderated. That will play out positively for emerging markets like India, for instance. Yes, definitely. Uh emerging markets, Japan, for example, net importer, these markets definitely benefit from lower oil prices. Uh, we've been positive on, on these geographies. Uh, currencies have been stable. Uh, so yes, however, uh, that's been the case for a long time now. So all the benefit of these low prices have consolidated. And in India's case, uh, remember, it's not just the uh, uh, oil prices. You're also getting the cheaper Russian oil still. So it's a net beneficiary from that aspect as well. Uh, we heard earlier from Carol that it is about demand from China. Let's take a listen to what the IEA had to say about that demand. China was the engine of the global oil demand growth, and this engine switches to electricity now. Uh, therefore, uh, we expect that the global oil demand will be weak, and uh, before 2030, it will peak. But after, afterwards, we still need oil, of course. And Carol, what assumptions are you making about China's oil demand? What numbers are out there, especially on the back of what it said over the weekend? Data suggesting consumption remains very low. I mean, it's low compared to what we used to, we are very accustomed to before, let's say, the COVID pandemic. But they are, but China is still the biggest oil importer in the world. So it's not a player to be underestimated in global oil market. We're thinking about the, the growth potential. It, the demand for oil is still growing in China. The Chinese economy is still growing, but not at the rate that many would have hoped for, especially that when you look at the growth engine for oil demand in the world, all eyes were on Asia and particularly on China. And if that engine is weakened because of fundamental structural economic problems in China, then you will see the impact immediately on global oil demand. So this is a situation, it's not that it is faltering or not growing, it is growing, but at a slower pace than what we are accustomed to, especially before the, uh, the COVID pandemic. 
Might the MPC meeting, the upcoming MPC meeting, be a game changer for you? Because people are looking for clarity on how that fiscal stimulus will be implemented and could perhaps reverse the consumption story in China. You see, I, I hesitate when I answer this question because so far, yes, we are seeing some support from the government for the Chinese economy. But so far, every time we expect something big to happen, we see only a small step, a baby step. Given the, big, the, the size of the problem, given the scale of the problem, it's not a problem that's going to dissipate any time. So it would have been naive to believe that the fundamental problem, particularly with the property sector, the biggest sector in the Chinese economy, to, to evaporate or to dissipate suddenly. We, if, you, if you want to see this kind of strong optimism, we would like to see much bigger support from the government to the economy and not this piecemeal uh, support here and there and seeing how the economy is responding to. And Polka, I saw you shaking your head to the <laughs> question that I asked. <laughs> and I absolutely uh, agree with Carol on that. The only thing I'll disagree with, it's not baby steps. It's one step forward and two steps back for China until now. We're finally possibly seeing some initial signs that the government has accepted that something needs to be done for the economy and not just they, they're willing to compromise a bit on their long-term structural plans and focus on the near-term growth. Uh, NPC, yes, it, uh, it, it can be very disappointing also for the reason that they'll probably wait for the U.S. elections to decide what should be the big bazooka and where it should be focused. So yes, and any, uh, any results that we will see from all the measures that have come through yet, they are going to manifest only later next year, not even early part of the next year. So yes, the demand is going to remain weak for a while. And Carol, we've been talking about a supply overhang. How much access are we talking about here? I mean, you have to look at the numbers, and the numbers so far, they come from different sources, and they are not necessarily the same. So if you look at the IE and OPEC, you do have this agreement, for example, on pictures. And mind you, there's also different sources. So if you look at OPEC+, Plus, because this is where we're seeing certain production uh, um, targets, and those production targets are not being respected by some members. Now, it does not matter by how much or how little. What matters is that you do have the second largest producer in OPEC, that is Iraq, constantly failing to delivering on its promises. And despite the promises that they were going to compensate, we are seeing Iraq still overproducing. And that by itself can weaken the commitment or the credibility or the influence of OPEC plus within oil markets. So it's a question of bringing all those outliers in, in line with the commitments that they have made, and then you would see OPEC making a bigger influence on oil markets, particularly given the non-OPEC plus supply from the US, which continues to surprise many people on the upside. And I don't see we're going to see production from the US weakening anytime soon. You may see a bit of reaction to lower prices, but prices are still healthy for those producers to make some very, uh, safe and good profits to maintain their production levels. Uh, you talk about the production in the U.S. I'm just wondering whether a Trump or a Harris administration would alter that, whoever gets into office. If I look at the U.S. Uh, production only, domestic production, the immediate thinking that people might, you know, might cross their mind is that Trump is pro-industry oil and gas industry, Harris is anti-oil and gas industry. But let's remind ourselves here that the share revolution in the U.S. happened under Obama, a Democratic president. Record production in U.S. oil production also happened under Democratic uh, president, including President Biden. Uh, we saw the record production last year and also this year. So in this sense, it's not clear Cut. They can influence, yes, investment sentiments and confidence in the economy, in the sector. But at the end, the shale producers in the U.S. are responding to global oil prices. So that's why I wouldn't limit the impact of Trump or Harris on the domestic industry. I would see how would they influence the global uh, trade, global economy, relationship with other producers such as Iran, Russia, and, Ch and China as right. a consumer. And that will impact oil prices and therefore U.S. oil production. Isn't it also true that a Trump administration is like to enforce the sanctions against Iranian oil? Up to now, the U.S. has pretty much closed one eye. You're absolutely right. And that is one area where I expect to see the Trump administration to take a much tougher stance than, let's say, if we have a Harris administration. Because we saw when President 
Trump came to power. He had a zero export policy from Iran. That did not happen, but he still managed to squeeze Iranian oil exports to a small 500,000 barrels a day, so half a million barrels a day. But when President Trump, Biden came to power, we saw a weakening in the enforcement of the sanctions on Iran. We saw Iranian exports gradually increasing and reaching very high levels, you know, above the million, almost uh, up to two million at some point. So in that respect, if Trump comes to power, one way he's going to inf to affect affect uh, global oil markets is through the enforcement of the sanctions on Iran. That could lead to significant loss of barrels from the market. And by the way, those barrels are not supposed to be in the market, but because of poor enforcement mm. of the sanctions, they are making their way to the market, particularly to China. Uh, Carol, just one final question. Given all the assumptions and the scenarios that you've painted, is it fair to say that you can forget about $100 oil? It is closer to 50 than it is to 100 bucks. Look, whether it's 100, 105, or 95, it's all the same. But yes, I strongly believe that this three triple digit oil price was over optimistic for this year as we saw with some expectations and some forecasts that was in my opinion premature again anything can happen but whether it hits 100 or not the question is if let's say the situation explodes in the middle east and we do see this hundred dollar oil price that many hoped for how long are we going to stay in that territory when you look at the market fundamentals you see if that indeed happens it's going to be quite short-lived Carol, thank you so much for that. Carol Nachli, CEO and founder at Crystal Energy. Paul Kamishra, Javelin, is staying with us. Just some alert here right now. We have Japan's uh, LDP's Shinjiro Koizumi will be stepping down as party election uh, campaign chief. Uh, according to NHK, uh, the Prime Minister Ishiba has accepted that resignation. Uh, Japan's LDP election campaign chief Koizumi will be... Uh, stepping down, will be resigning. Uh, it's been de he's decided to resign, according to Gigi Press reports, in a post on X without saying where it got that information. Now, more top corporate stories we are following. Boeing is said to be planning to launch a capital hike as soon as Monday. A source says the plane maker could raise over $15 billion from the fundraising, and the amount could still rise depending on demand. Boeing needs the capital infusion to maintain its investment grade rating and fund its eventual recovery from a crippling strike now in its seventh week. The union put out a statement earlier saying that it has been in talks with the U.S. Labor Department about getting back to the negotiating table. And Olympus shares are under pressure in Japan after news the company's CEO has resigned. Stefan Kaufman stepped down after investigation into alleg allegations he purchased illegal drugs. The company says Kaufman likely engaged in behaviors that were inconsistent with a code of conduct. Chairman Yasuo Taiuchi will act as interim CEO. And here's a look at Indian markets just ahead of the open. India opens in just under three minutes. Uh, take a a look at where we are in terms of the Sensei index pointing to a higher open up three tenths of one percent. The other benchmarks also in positive territory. We're well, keeping an eye on ICICI Bank and reported second quarter profit that surpassed analysts' expectations. ICICI pointing to a higher open up by about two and a half percent. Now, demand for retail loans remains strong in India and India's largest airline, Indigo, also in focus. Of course, it trades under Interglobe Aviation, currently down by about three and a half percent. As we count down to the open, in India. It's first in two years, by the way, those surprise loss weighed down by higher fuel bill and a jump in maintenance costs. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. It has been trading for about a minute. We're keeping an eye on ICICI Bank in particular, beating estimates, uh, taking a look where we are in terms of that stock. It is in positive ter territory in what is a positive day uh, for India. ICICI Bank up by 2.5% on the back of that better than expected numbers. Interglobe Aviation, though, in the opposite direction. Take a look at how it is slumping right now, down about 9%. Uh, we had Indigo uh, CEO uh, 
on uh, Asia Trade tomorrow to give us a sense of uh, what went wrong for the company. It, uh, of course, um, fell short of Asimus. On the back of that, Interglobe Aviation, the parent company, slumping about 9% as we speak. Now, on to markets. Paul Kamishra, partner at Javelin Wealth Management, is still with us. We want to drill down on some of the top conviction calls, which continues to be India, Japan, and the tech sector. Let's start with India, since we've just talked about the uh, Indian market earnings. Uh, some have missed estimates, but you're still pretty upbeat about the Indian market. Yes, I think it is It is a, a, a one-off, and we do expect some uh, bumps in the earnings. We're going to see a lot more volatility in the market. But on the whole, the fundamental story is very, very strong. Strong policy, uh, uh, low, low deficit. Uh, and I was just looking at, at the data. In, in, in it, you've got a 50% of the population out of the 1.4 billion that is below 30 years of age. So you've got this very hungry working population. It's fairly entrepreneurial, very enterprising population that is a huge resource for India to tap into, which is also probably the Achilles heel because you have to find jobs for that big a population. But on the whole, India's story is very, very strong. Whenever we are going to have uh, some sell-offs in the Indian market, it will be sharp. Uh, the retail has investors have really come back in the market, and they react very fast. So the moms and pops are back, back in the market. So when we saw the uh, flows out of India and going to China, around eight ten billion went out within a week's time, and we had two billion coming in from Indian retail. So that's the size of the retail participation. So the sell-offs will be a little more exaggerated for that reason. The correction yeah. is close to 10%. Have yes. you seen the worst? Is this the bottom and is it going to rally from here? I think so. I don't think it's going to fall too much from there. So I would say buy on dips when, when it comes to India. It's a very long-term conviction holding for us and for a lot of asset managers. You talk about how fundamentals remain strong. Let's yeah. talk about growth. Yeah. We're looking at about six and a half percent. Yeah. I mean, to some countries, that's fantastic growth. But this is India. Yeah. People say India needs to grow at least eight to 10 percent to lift more people out of poverty and to create more jobs. How do you I, respond to that? Yeah, I, I don't think it is about growth alone. I think 7 8% growth is a very fair number for India. The Getting people out of poverty and creating those jobs, the bigger problem is the skill gap. So yes, we're having around a million new youth coming into the working population every month. So every six months, India has to find job for an equivalent of Singapore. So that's a big challenge. But along with that, we're also hearing from corporates that we're not finding enough people. So there's a huge skill, that, skill gap that needs to be covered to enable the youth to get into those high skill job markets. They, they don't want to be involved in the unorganized sector anymore. They don't want to work in farms anymore. They want to do the high-end corporate jobs now. So that's where the gap is. And that's the problem that has to be solved. Uh, the government did did allocate a significant amount of budget to skill up 2 million Indians, uh, you know, youth a year. And that's a step in the right direction. But we also need participation from the private sector there. There have been some subsidies announced. The question is whether those measures will be effective or not and how fast. How do you play India? Is it about the tech space? Uh, a broad market allocation in itself is uh, quite attractive. But if you look at it, yes, tech is interesting infrastructure definitely the amount of spend that's going to happen in india in the next 10 11 uh, in the next 2 years is equivalent to what was spent on the infrastructure in the last 11 years so infrastructure is also a, a favored story at some point yes i would put some money into the consumer space as we see the revival in in, in that sector so those are the ones that i would play if, we we yeah. continue to see the outflow from yeah. india to china yet yeah. you're not convinced you're not in china what would it take for you to start thinking about dipping your toes in the China market. Yeah, so we've been in China before, and it, it kicked us out. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we talked a little bit about China previously. We're finally seeing some signs from the go government to make a concerted effort towards. But what fixing would it take problem. for you to start thinking of China as your yeah. investment alternative? A lot more clarity on the how. So we say, okay. 
2 trillion, 3 trillion, but how is it going to flow through the local governments? How is it going to support the banks? And how is it going to support the, the real estate struck, uh, sector? That's the most important element that's been missing. So we've not seen that clarity on how the execution and implementation of those policies are going to happen. So that's what is important. So China, China as a market, you can't wait for everything to line up and then take your position, because by that time it has run up already. But you need some indication that, OK, yes, we have this long-term agenda of you know, techno, uh, you know, high-tech leadership, et cetera, et cetera. But now we're not going to ignore the near term. We are going to invest in growth, and we are going to invest in growth in a bit more sustainable manner, so not just throwing helicopter cash to 5 million of the underprivileged, but how are you going to support the sectors that have been struggled? The, the, the policy making and the implementation so far, the way it has come out has not been effective. So for instance, when we talked about reducing uh, uh, rates for home buyers, uh, what you do, the, the way the, 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 it was structured is basically saying asking the banks to reduce the lending rates. But the banks are already struggling with their margins. The NIMS are already below the regulatory requirements. So you're taking the problem away from one place and putting it in another. It's like trying to fix a mm. pipe which has got multiple holes in it. You put pressure on one, the other starts splitting out. So. Bulka, it is such a huge week for markets. Not only do we have uh, eco data out of um, China, we also are you know, keeping tabs on how the Max 7 will perform. Yes. It is a space that's gotten everybody excited. All, or well, almost all, I guess, last week said that you can't go wrong putting your money in Max 7. Do you agree? I do agree at this point, uh, more even from a fundamental perspective. So market movements have been slightly different from what's actually happening in the economics of these, these companies. Uh, the results will not be as spectacular as they have been uh, uh, in the last few quarters, except the last quarter, but they'll still be reasonable. But if you look at the earnings, earnings, revisions, earnings growth, uh, to give you an example of the Dow, the, old, the growth, earnings growth has come only from the MAG 7 and the tech sector a little bit more. You take them out, actually earnings growth has been negative. The revisions have been negative. So the Dow, for example, from the start of the year to now, the earnings have been revised down 7%, and it's up 12%. It's 20% more expensive when actually the fundamentals have weakened. So yes, for us, that is the core reason to stay with the technology uh, sector in the US, the MAG7, definitely. And this is not a, a story from the 2000s where you know it's just mad money going into it. These are cash flow positive companies. These are massive companies. But you also see a broadening of this rally? Uh, what the broadening has happened from the perspective of the markets. But we haven't seen the broadening in the results yet. So the earnings, the profitability, we haven't seen that broadening yet. And that's a risk that's building into the markets because when the earnings start to not deliver, that's when you could see a sell off, which is a risk for the small and mid cap sector as well. We've seen so much money go into that, but the numbers are not out yet. And when we see the results is when we'll know what actually is under the hood. All right, more clarity. As yeah. always, Polka, it's been great having you with us today. Thanks. Polka Mishra, Javelin Wealth Management. And before we go, here's a look at our guests for tomorrow. We'll get exclusive insights on the biggest investment opportunities from the CIO of Singapore's state-owned investor. We're talking to Masig. We'll also speak exclusively with former GECO Lawrence Kulp, who now leads the company's aerospace unit. Plus, the CEO of Singaporean Asset Manager Capital joins us to discuss their big bet on data centers. That is it for Insight. This is Bloomberg.